Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. And lift our Bibles and wave them around. Make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm so glad to be in church today. I'm here to magnify you and exalt you. You have no rival. You have no equal. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God and for the Holy Ghost to enlighten that Word to our hearts. The eyes of our understanding are flooded with light today, and our faith groweth exceedingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated. And let's turn in our Bibles today to Mark 11. No, Brother Hagen, Kenneth E. Hagen did not write the book of Mark. But I mean, he preached that, he preached that word. Mark 11, and then also, I'm going to give you kind of an unusual one. You're going to have to guess what I, why, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. <laughs> Uh-oh, where is he going with that? <laughs> You'll find out. All right, Mark 11, I'm still looking. I have a new Bible. I still pages stick together. I've got to break it in. Maybe I'll put it outside and the sprinkler will hit it. Mark eleven twenty four. Mark eleven twenty four. We're gonna. You thought I was gonna do twenty three, didn't you? I know you did. But twenty four. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus is speaking. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. What things soever you desire. When you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. You've got 23 up, but it needs to be 24. Mark 11, 24. There you go. All right, and then Song of Solomon. Now you're going to find out why in the world has he got that verse. It's just a little one. It's a little, but it's important. Right after Ecclesiastes, Solomon's Song, chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little one, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. So we quote it like this, and we don't quote it accurately, but it means the same thing. The little foxes spoil the vine. It's a, it's a principle, little foxes. Minor things can get in the way of big things. So today I wanted to uh, share a message entitled, Adjusting Your Receiver. Adjusting Your Receiver. Now I've been teaching you out of uh, the power of prayer. We, we spent four weeks on that. We all need a prayer life. A prayer life is not just emergency mode when you have an emergency prayer life. It's consistency. It's, it's how you live. Every day you have, a, you, ha, you have some prayer with God. You have commune, communion and fellowship with God. And then, of course, we talked about, uh, you know, building your world with words because out of your prayer life will come words that you need from God. But here we see what things soever you desire, you're going you're to have some desires, some godly desires. You're going to have some fleshly desires that are not necessarily sinful desires. But there might be desires that you come up with that are not consistent with God's plan for your life. Or it wouldn't be wisdom for you if God granted that desire to be yours at this point in time. It wouldn't be the best for you. How many of you know God's our Father and He wants us blessed? I mean, you know, when I, was, when I was 13, I started driving a car. I got my license. And by the time I was 14, all my buddies had cars. I mean, they, they, went, they raided my next-door neighbor. He was a World War II vet, and he had two old antique cars. He had a 39 Chrysler and a 41 Plymouth sitting in his garage up on blocks. And he happened to have his garage door up one day when they, they came by to see me. And, oh, I, I said, oh, don't bother him. I mean, I never, I've never even talked to him. I mean, you know, I knew he was a vet. He's kind of a strange guy. But what he drove around town, those of you that are car nuts will identify with this. Others of you won't. But he had a 56 Chevrolet uh, two-door wagon. 
Nomad. With a 265 power pack, that means a four-barrel carburetor. I mean, it was a cool, I mean, this old man, I, and so I knew back then what a cool car that was. And, and so, you know, those two guys, they bought those cars and fixed them up, and they were driving them all over Refurio, and my parents wouldn't let me have a car until I graduated high school. I had to drive my mother's car. That's a bummer. I guess they knew something I didn't know. No, God knows a lot that you don't know. So sometimes we need to adjust our receiver. Uh, this is the year of momentum. I mean, we talked about those signs that God is granting it just this very week in New York. I mean, they've had lightning bolt hit the Statue of Liberty right on the torch. I mean, I saw the picture of it. Just went right down, hit the torch right there. It's just, I know it's probably been struck before, but all I know is it happened just last, the third. And then on the fifth was that horrible meeting in, in, in the UN and they're, they're discussing the fate of Israel and saying that they're not going to, you know, calls up Netanyahu and reads him the riot act. I mean, who do you think you are, you stuffed shirted old bag of bones? You don't know anything. Sorry to call them names. I just, I, you know, it's all I can do to keep my composure when I see these things. It's such idiocy. You're the one that messed up in Afghanistan. Nobody's called you up and told you you were a fool like you should be told because we're still the number one superpower in the, on the globe and we're acting like we don't have anything, don't have any power at all. We're going to tell Israel how to solve their problem. So uh, these, these signs, this, this, this earthquake that hit, uh, it wasn't major. You know, they, they mocked it. Some of the showed pictures, says, uh, uh, sh showed a picture on, on Facebook. They uh, overturned garbage can, a, a garbage can overturned. It shook a little bit, and the garbage can full of garbage and was top heavy anyway. Garbage stacked up this tall above the garbage can. It fell over during the earthquake. It says, we will rebuild. Ha, 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 see. They're mocking the sign instead of paying attention to the sign. You know, it's God's mercy that it wasn't 7.8. Or 8.8. .8. They think they're exempt. They're not exempt. New York is, a, is really, it's a, it's a landing place for God's judgment. Why? Because it's the financial capital of the world still. And evil is there. Evil is there. So, uh, so the glory is coming. I mean, you know, the same wave that brings the glory brings destruction. There's coming a revival and there's coming a separation. There's coming. I mean, people, you know, people are going to have to choose sides pretty quick. A lot of them have already chosen sides. We don't know who they are. I mean, some people that chose the wrong side can still get saved. I'm not saying they can't be. Nobody's, as long as we're here, all things are possible. Maybe you've got relatives. Maybe you've even got kids or maybe you've even got parents that have chosen the wrong side and they're just infected with this wokeism, well, that's all right. Just keep praying and, and claiming their salvation. I mean, you've got more power than the devil. You've got more influence than he does. So <clears throat> the glory is coming, and, and my job is to build your faith. My job is to prepare you to uh, occupy your land. What does that mean exactly? Possess your inheritance. In other words, to have in readiness everything God sent Jesus on the cross to pay for. Jesus paid for everything. He's already granted it. We've already been blessed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He was cursed so we could be blessed. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ? I like the Norley translation. We, it, we're blessed with all the blessings that heaven itself enjoys. That's the legal side. It's already been done. It's already on tap for us. But whether we receive it or not is another matter. Whether we see it and whether we receive it. Receive there in Mark eleven twenty four 24 means take with the hand. So it's hand-eye coordination. Are y'all with me now? 
I'm building your faith. I want, I want to prepare you to get God's best because we've got to have God's best to reap this harvest. If you're sick, if you're in pain, if you're broke, you're not going to be, effect, you're not going to be as effective as if you were healed and blessed financially with plenty of money. And I remember what it was like when I was starting to decline in my finances and I was scrambling, trying, sitting at my desk. I had this little office off of Strock Road over, over between, you know, right over next to, um, well, anyway, regardless where, it's, where it is. I had my checkbook out and I had a list of, of, of checks to write to my vendors. I'm, I'm building houses in those days and I've got to pay the lumber bill. And the lumber bill uh, that month was 11000 some odd dollars. And I was trying to figure out where am I going to get $11,000. My bank account was, you know, $600. And I started looking at where, where can I make a draw? Can I, do I have a draw available to the bank? I had construction loans, and you draw a construction loan draw. It's, it's based on uh, the percentage that you have finished, and then you're eligible to make a draw on that loan and I had just, I mean, I basically was just out of money. There was no money to be, av I couldn't borrow any more money. I'd already borrowed it. And I was, I was looking at a, at a deficit. I was, remember, I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm just sweating blood. <laughs> How effective can you be if that's you? There's millions and millions and millions and millions of people across this country that are in that shape right now because of Biden and Bidenomics. We went from the top to the bottom in about a six months. The best president we ever had was Donald J. Trump. Amen. I don't mind saying it. I don't care if anybody likes it or doesn't like it. It's the truth. He's the best president we ever had. He's the best president by far the church ever had. And all the criticism he gets from preachers and churches. I mean, it just shame on all of you to judge him for his life. Well, I, I don't see anything wrong with his life right now. He's doing everything he can to win. He wouldn't have to do, do any of it. He never would have had to have done any of this. He's a billionaire. He could have just stayed in Manhattan in his Trump Tower. But he came. He's a patriot. And I believe he loves God. I do believe he loves God. He's selling Bibles. Well, you know, they're good Bibles. I mean, the, the criticism he gets from church people is just, is we're, we're going to change it. Because it's just stupidity. It's people that are in an echo chamber and they hear it, heard it, and they probably heard it from the pulpit. You're not going to hear that from this pulpit. I don't know. I got off on this, didn't I? Well, I'm saying you're going to have to adjust your receiver because God's doing some pretty surprising things right now. So um, the glory is coming. It's on the way. You know, everything new is, uh, uh, everything old is new again. Everything that was receding is advancing again. And the kingdom of God mightily grows and prevails. That's what God gave me for this year, the year of, of momentum. God's momentum is building. He is, he is opening up and bringing signs, wonders, and miracles and harvests. I mean, things are changing rapidly. And so let's, let's just consider what the Word says here about, about your receiver. It's hand-eye coordination. Whatever you can see in the Bible that belongs to you, you can ask for. You can pray and ask for that when you see it's yours. And then when do you receive it? When you pray. Not when you get it. There's a difference between receiving it and having it. And that difference is seed time. Because we've already established this. It's going back, and this message will overlap some of the things that I've been preaching lately, but you've got to understand it's not instant potatoes that we have. It's, it's seed time and harvest. We plant a seed, and we wait, and we water the seed, and we praise Him as if it's already done. 
and we have a systematic discourse, our confession. Oh, I have that. Thank God I have that. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that. Hallelujah. I shall have it. You know, you shall have comes when the harvest is ripe. You put in the sickle with your mouth and you and you get you actually have that thing that you've been that you already received. So it's hand eye coordination. You've got to see some things. See, that gets back to your prayer life. It gets back to you seeing in the Bible what belongs to you. You've got to read it. You've got to, you've got to speak it. A few years ago, we had a, a wide receiver, and the coach in that, uh, Bill, Bill O'Brien, never was a fan of his. I was glad when he left. But he, just, he was a downer guy. Just never liked him. Sorry. I like the coach we have now and uh, for the Texans. He's a good man. He's a Christian. Got a lot of Christians on that ball club. They're, they're unashamed for Jesus. They talk about Jesus. They don't talk about God. They don't talk about Christ. They talk about Jesus, and Jesus is his name. Jesus is the name that is scorned. When you start talking about him, people will let you talk about God because God's anybody, see? But when you start talking about Jesus, that's when the arrows start flying. And these young men talk about Jesus, and they don't care. But anyway, getting back to the few years ago, we had this, this wide receiver, Hopkins, and uh, he was a kind of a, he was a big, tall guy, 6'3", 6'4", weighed about 215, which is pretty big for a wide receiver. But he, I'll tell you one thing, when he had a, a, a catch, what they call a catch radius where he's so big and so his arms are so long, you throw the ball, it's not really accurate, he still grabs it. And I would watch him on the sideline, and they'd throw, they have a football throwing machine, kind of like a baseball throwing machine. It throws a football, and it throws a football really fast, really hard with a perfect spiral, and he stood on the sidelines like this and would practice catching those balls with one hand. Catch radius. You're not going to get anything by him. I mean, if it's in the area, if there's somebody hanging on him, he's stronger than that guy. If somebody's reaching for the ball at the same time, his hands and fingers are stronger. He's going to pull that thing out of the sky and tuck it, and he's going to go for the score, and he's going to do the ballerina little feet together on the sideline. I mean, the guy was amazing, and this doofus coach, we let him, let him go for nothing. And he played another three or four years, had a great rest of his career. He could have finished his career here in Houston. But anyway, get by. I'm talking about receiving hand-eye coordination, folks. I mean, you, you, God has blessed you. The Bible, that's le all of that's legal. Legally, you're blessed. Legally, you're healed. Legally, you have all the money you need. God supplies all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, how come it hadn't showed up? You ain't received it. You probably need to make an adjustment to your receiver. Everybody say, I'm adjusting my receiver to receive everything. Well, that sounds kind of greedy. No, it's not greedy. In fact, it's an insult to Jesus' blood when you don't receive everything he paid for. What are you going to tell him? You're too good to receive everything he's got for you? No, you can't do that. He bought and paid for it. So it's up to us then to receive it. Back uh, when I was a kid, we moved out of Houston back down to South Texas. We moved from Galena Park, Texas. How many of you know where Galena Park is? It's right across the channel from Pasadena. It's on the ship channel, and uh, that's where I early years until a third, between the summer between the third and fourth grade years, we moved from there to Refurio. How many of you know where Refurio is? It's a little town in South Texas, halfway between Victoria and Corpus. Well, you know, I remember, you know, right before we moved, a couple of years before we moved, we wound up getting rid of the radio in the living room, and we had a television. And I became a television kid. I mean, I loved TV. I had my little mat that I laid on the wood floor, and I'd put my hand behind my head, and I'd look up at the television. I'd be, you know, about five feet from the TV screen. My mother would say, get away from the television. It's going to make your eyes go, you know, and she, she kept saying that till I had to have glasses in the fourth grade. Thank you very much, Mother. Appreciate it. Confessed my way into glasses. Thank you. She just convinced 
The TV was going to eat my eyeballs out. But anyway, television, man, it was just so cool. Well, you know, here in Houston, you had any trouble. We've got three channels, and you, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, you know, you got lots of choices. Uh, and so then, but when we moved to Refurio, you're way away from the stations. I mean, the stations are in Corpus, and 50 miles away, the, the station in Rabbit Ear. Are you kidding? Rabbit Ear, you don't even bother with those. You don't get anything but snow with Rabbit Ear. And if you have a regular TV antenna, how many of you remember regular TV antennas? You know, they're sitting outside of the house, you know. Well, those weren't any good there either because you, you're still going to have, you're going to get one of the three channels and it's going to be kind of mostly snowy. So my dad did all the investigating. We moved into a rent house. And I mean, we hadn't been there two weeks and they had guys come out and they, they erected this mast on the side of our house that was 30 foot tall. No joke. And it had this massive antenna. And it had a motor underneath the antenna and with a cable that ran to a place, to a, a controller sitting on the top of the TV. And so when you wanted to tune in to Channel 6, which was the NBC affiliate, well, then you just went over there and you turned the knob and it would go click, click, click. And the whole antenna would turn until the picture would clear up on the television. And then you'd say, okay, it's tuned in. So you had two tuners. You had the tuner on the TV and you had the tuner on the antenna. Are you with me now? I mean, you had to what? Adjust the receiver to get the signal. And it's just amazing. I mean, they're all generally, you know, south of us. I mean, it's not like one of them's over here and one of them's over here. They're all just that direction, that general direction. I mean, if 50 miles and maybe they're three miles, five miles apart at the end of 50 miles. That's just a little bit of difference. And yet it made all the difference on being able to see the signal. Are you with me now? Little foxes will spoil the vine. Little adjustments can make big differences in what you hear and what you receive. Come on, lift your hands right now. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm working really hard up here to get this over to you. All right, praise God. So, uh, adjust your receiver. God's already given you everything you need. He's already done it. It's already happened. It's not when you see your covenant, you don't even have to pray for healing. I've told I've told you that over and over. I mean, I can hear baby Christians, "Oh God, please heal me." I've got a cousin that he still plays like that. All he just pay. He has never grown. He's never grown. He just prays a baby prayer. Why don't you read your Bible? You're so brilliant in other areas. Why do you stick with praying for healing when you've already got it? It's silly. You don't have to pray for it because why? He already sees you healed. It's not a matter of praying for it. It's a matter of you receiving it, period, end of story. <laughs> That's all it is. And so uh, adjust your receiver. So as we're reading here, let's go back to Mark 11. This is Jesus talking. And there, you know, remember the whole thing was triggered by him cursing the fig tree. And the next day they came by and the fig tree was grown up, uh, dried up by the roots. And, and so he used that as a teachable moment to teach them about faith. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed or if you had, you know, so forth and so on. So he, in Mark 11... He challenged, he said, have, have faith in God. Said, How did you do this? He said, have the God kind of faith. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have all against any, verse 25. See, sometimes we get stuck on 23 and even on 24, but we forget about 25 and 26. So my first adjust your receiver point is make sure you're walking in love. Make sure you're walking in forgiveness because people are going to do you wrong. People are going to talk about you. People are going to step on you. People are going to just do things that hurt your feelings, and you can either mope around and hold it against them and or you can forgive them. 
You can forgive them. You, you must forgive them. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So let me ask you, if you're going to ask for something and you're praying or you're saying, either one in verse 23 or 24. 23 talks about speaking to the mountain. 24 talks about praying and asking. Either one, if you've got unforgiveness and you're not walking in love, I mean, what are your chances of receiving what God has for you? Because everything is spiritual. All healing is not medicine. Healing is not the doctor. Healing is not some exercise. Healing is spiritual. That's, it's always spiritual. It's not the chemotherapy. It's not the radiation. It's spiritual. And if it isn't spiritual, then it isn't healing. I'm saying it again. If it isn't spiritual, it isn't healing. It might be treating. It might be a Band-Aid on a gushing wound. But it's not healing. Healing is spiritual. Healing is bought and paid for by the precious blood of Christ, which has already been shed. 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. The same sacrifice that took our sin took our sicknesses. You don't ever say, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just believing I'll be saved one day. Oh, I just know one of these days I'll get saved. No, you know you're saved. You, your confession is I am saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Well, we have the same kind of assurance about healing. So then it's just a matter of, of receiving. And one of the points of adjustment where many times we need to make is we need to check up our love life because it's right there adjoining this verse that we're talking about. I mean, you know, talk about blinking lights, you know. This is it. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> this is where people miss it when they fail to walk in love. We're, we have one commandment, love. That's it. And forgiveness is part of love. If you love somebody, then you don't walk in unforgiveness toward them. Is it your, is it your uh, approval of what they've done? No, no, it's not the approval of what they've done. It's just that you refuse to let that fester and you refuse to get back at them. You just, ha well, how can I do that? With your mouth? You're told to do it. You can do it because he told, he wouldn't tell you to do something if you couldn't do it. I just can't forgive. Yes, you can forgive. Well, you don't know what they did. It doesn't matter what they did. I mean, I, I, I heard of, uh, I don't know, 60 Minutes or one of these news shows, and they had a, a, a couple that, that were uh, talking about a, a guy that killed their daughter. I mean, he, he beat her to, literally beat her to death. Raped and murdered her, beat her to death. Just horrible. And it came up that they both forgave this guy and asked for a meeting with him. He, he got convicted of the, of the crime and was sent to life, life in prison. I think we need to turn back the clock and, and adopt the codes that we used to have where people go to the electric chair for such behavior. I'm just sorry. I'm, I'm for the death penalty. Sorry. I just say that right now. That's what's wrong. See, because God said there's certain punishments, including death. And so when you are smarter than God, then you're too smart. And this is why we have dishonor, dis, all this horrible stuff. You know, and they would think twice if they knew for sure that it wasn't going to take 20 years. Well, what about the innocent ones? Well, there's, there, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about innocent people being put to death, but I'm a lot more concerned about innocent people suffering needlessly at the hands of criminals. Well, which is it? You know, they had that same thing in the Bible. Anyway, we have to walk in love. And so this couple met with this prisoner and, and, and forgave him, and it didn't matter to him at all. And so the, the interviewer, he anyway, didn't seem like he, he never even apologized. It wasn't about him. It's about us. It doesn't matter whether he uh, accepted what we did or not. It doesn't matter whether he... Uh, liked it or didn't like it. It was on us. We wanted the, uh, 
the ability to face him and to tell him we release him, we forgive him. Is it okay what he didn't know? He's right where he belongs. But we forgive him. And of course, so, you know, the newsman, he's lost as a goose. He doesn't understand that. A lot of people, the world doesn't understand why. But if we just do the word, I'm telling you, we're the, we're the beneficiaries. We clear the matter up and everything that's spiritual comes crystal clear. We get a crystal clear picture. Are you getting this now? I remember years ago, Dodie, we first started going to Lakewood. Dodie was diagnosed with metastatic cancer of the liver. Dodie Osteen, John Osteen, my pastor. Uh, he's in heaven now, but Dodie's still, I think, 90, and she's doing great. She's still moving around and doing what she's always done, praise for the sick. Wonderful woman. And, but I was at Lakewood when she was diagnosed with metastatic cancer of the liver, and they sent her home to die. She had weeks to live. Nothing they could do for her in those years. She was down to 89 pounds. Just she looked as sick as she was. She never missed a service. She came, she came, she came, she came. And every time she'd come, she had to go right by that graveyard, big old cemetery. The devil had, you're going to be right out there in a few weeks, you know, just tormenting her. And everybody that came to town, they all wanted to pray for Dodie, you know, Brother Hagen wanted to lay hands on her, and Brother Copeland wanted to lay hands. Everybody that came to Lakewood wanted to, you know, Oral Roberts, oh, tell Dodie I want to come and lay hands on her. Well, that's fine, but it's her faith that's going to make the difference. It's not anybody laying their hands on her. She is a mature Christian. She knows the Word of God, and she could not depend on everybody else's faith. She had to develop her faith. And one of the first things she did was she started checking her heart for anything that lacking, lacking in love. Have I offended anybody? Have I ever done anything against anybody uh, wrong? I want to get that cleared up. And she did what the nuns taught me to examine my conscience. I did get something out of eight years of Catholic education. I mean, you know, we can pray, but sometimes we just have to look inside and search our own conscience, our own heart. And that's what she did. And you know what she came and she wrote letter after letter after letter. You know, I knew you and I just think maybe I might have done this. And of course, it was all just overkill. Nobody. She didn't find anybody that she'd wronged. But this one lady she wrote a letter to. And uh, I'll just call her Doris. Doris, I just wanted to apologize. She said, when we were kids out in the playground, uh, you never got to play baseball. You had to run for me. I, I got to bat, but I couldn't run the bases, and you ran the bases for me, and I robbed you of that. You know, you could have stood there and hit the ball. I should have just stood on the sidelines. I shouldn't have been playing uh, playing the game. I should have just watched y'all play, but here you were. Uh, see, please forgive me. She said, Dodie, I, I, it delighted me to be able to help you that way. I was so honored that I was chosen to run for you. You hit the ball and I'd run for you. She said, I think about that from time to time. He said, absolutely, you do not. You didn't do me any. You know, see, she was released. See, but what, what was she doing? She was, she was emptying all, uh, removing all obstructions to her signal. They were got to be willing. Amen. Glory to God. And she got her healing. I mean, she was totally healed and stayed that way. Glory to God. The word works. So adjust your receiver. Make sure you're walking in love. You know, look 1 Corinthians 13 in the Amplified. Love suffers long and is kind. <laughs> Love takes no account of a suffered wrong. I mean, I dub, I'll double dog dare you to read 1 Corinthians 13 in the Amplified. Because you won't get very far in there until you'll find out, uh, ooh, ow, eh, ow. See, you'll have something, you'll have some adjustments to make. You'll have some adjustments. I guarantee, I guarantee you, Justin Wilson. I guarantee. All right, enough of that. All right, so number two, let's look at 1 John 5. Second thing. You get anything out of this today? Yes. Well, it's basic, but it's, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, and my job is to get you in a position 
to receive everything God has for you. And if I don't do that, then I'll have to give an account. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, or that we have, my margin says, concerning him, concerning God. This is the confidence that we have concerning God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know. We don't guess. We don't wonder. We know. Look at all the no's in those K-N-O-W. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You link, link that back up to Mark 11, 24. That's where John got it. If you pray according to his will. I didn't say you pray Lord, if it be thy will. No, that's not what that's saying at all. That is not what that is saying. Because if you pray a prayer like, Lord, if it be thy will, you shouldn't have prayed it anyway because you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you're asking. That's a vain prayer. It's stupid. It's an un- where, where, how do you know it's answered then or not answered? You put a big if in the middle of it. That's not faith. Faith sees and when it's, see, it's spiritual, and see, a prayer gets back to your prayer life, gets back to reading your Bible. Without the prayer life, without the Bible, you're not going to see very much, and you're not going to receive very much. You're going to live far below what God has. You can even have a pretty good confession. I know people that do know how to talk, but they don't read their Bible, and they don't pray, and they just try to get by with confession. I confess that I got me a Mercedes Benz. Glory to God, I'm going to have me. <laughs> Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> Janice Joplin, 1971, from Port Arthur, Texas. The old song. How many of you have ever heard that old song? Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes? How many of you prayed that? No, I mean. <laughs> well, it, you might be eligible for a Mercedes Benz if, you've, if you're in that financial category and you can afford to fix it. As one who have, who's owned two used Mercedes, but not one, two Mercedes Benz, I can testify how expensive they are to keep on the road. So you might just need to do a cost benefit analysis before you ask <laughs> how, much of, how much of your total income do you want to dedicate to keeping your Mercedes Benz on the road? Why not a Rolls Royce? Why, you know, what sky's the limit, right? No, make sure that what you desire, number two, point number two, make sure that whatever, what it is that you desire is God's will for you. And God's will, I mean, God's will for you is, is ever increasing. I mean, when you are faithful over little things, he'll make you ruler over much. I mean, he'll, let, he'll start you out. He'll, tr- he'll trust you with a little bit and see how you do. He'll see whether you'll maintain that Kia soul. Will you change the oil? Will you keep, you know, will you keep it in good repair? It doesn't cost near as much to repair a Kia soul as it does a Mercedes S-Class, S63. Mercedes used to have a V12. You, 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 want a, you want a barrel full of money when you take that in for service. Are y'all with me now? Make sure what you desire is God's will for you. Faith begins where the will of God is known. How, see, there, this is the general will of God. But it doesn't tell you what to drive. It doesn't tell, tell you where to live. It doesn't tell you who to marry. It gives you, grow, it, gives you, it gives you some indicators. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Don't marry the devil. What do you mean, marry the devil? Well, that's exactly, read it for yourself, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. When you get unequally yoked as a believer with an unbeliever, you might as well marry the devil. No wonder you're miserable. So don't choose to do that. Gladys wound up okay. She married the devil, and the devil got saved. (laughs) Turned into Hitler. No, I didn't. (laughs) 
Make sure what you desire is God's will. Well, how do I know? Well, John 16, 14, Jesus said, The Holy Ghost will take of mine and show it unto you. See, it gets back to that prayer life. It gets back to reading your Bible. You, you, you just read your Bible and pray and hang out with God, and you, you know what belongs to you. Just have, and there's a desire, and if there's a desire in your heart, you start saying, Well, Lord, I, I, what, what about that? And, you know, and, you know I, a few years ago, I mean, every preacher I knew had a Harley Davidson. And, uh, and man, I mean, I wanted one. In fact, I sowed a big seed to help another preacher buy another preacher a Harley Davidson. Big old road glide. And uh, so I sowed a seed thinking, you know, I'm kind of sow a seed. And I didn't ask the Lord. I mean, it was good for me to help that. But I, was, I had a motive that I'm, I might want to wind up. But I hadn't asked for one yet. And I spent a year buying all kind of books. I even went by the store and sat on one. And uh, that's one of those leftover desires from your childhood. I always wanted to, not just any motorcycle, a Harley. Nothing sounds like a Harley. And that's what I wanted. And after about a year, I probably had $150, $200 worth of magazines with Harleys in them. And one day, I wasn't paying any attention to anything. He said, by the way, uh, it's no on the Harley. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even asked. <laughs> well, okay, mama. You know, my mama wouldn't even let me. Not only would they not let me have a car, they wouldn't even let me have a moped. My cousin had a moped. Oh, why are you talking about that? Well, because it's real life that we live. You've got a, lots of decisions to make, and you can cooperate with the Holy Ghost. You can cooperate with faith. You can cooperate with the open door that God has already given you. And things, I, I tell you, God will bless you with things that you wouldn't even ask for. He's done that over and over with me. I didn't even ask. But I went through a time when he had to make a demand on me. Like, I'm a car guy. I've always been a car guy since a kid. I'm a, I don't know why. I love cars. I sit on my grandmother's porch. In Baytown, Texas, look, here's Texas Avenue. I mean, it's just all this crowd. Three, I'm three or four years old. I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Three or four years old. And I just to told them, I'd sit on the porch, John, what's that? And I'd tell them the year and the make of that car driving by. That's a 48 Pontiac. That's a 47 Chevrolet. That's a, that's a 51 Plymouth. That, I just tell them exactly what year. I mean, I'm born in 47. How do I know what's a 35 Ford is? But I did. See, I've just been a car nut. But when I got saved, you know, God started pruning me a little bit. Oh, okay, you're a car nut. Okay, well, how about giving that 1940 Cadillac to Lakewood? Huh? <laughs> he had to say it twice. But I did. I did. I gave it. And so he, he had to prove me in that area. And since then, you know, God's let me have some pretty nice cars. I, but I didn't start out. I had, to, I had to crucify my desire. I had to crucify my tendency. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Otherwise, you're just walking in the flesh and, and calling it God. Well, just look at my new Mercedes. And it's, you know, a $3,000 a month payment. Yeah, look, look at your Mercedes. It ain't paid for. It's not even close to being paid for. I'm not against it, but I mean, did God really do it or not? You can make things happen yourself and get stuck. But the Holy Ghost will show you what belongs to you. Are you getting anything out of this? All right, see, little foxes spoil the vine. Little foxes, little, little things like that can interfere with what God wants to do in your life. The last one is make sure to ask God to lead you to the area of your life that you need to adjust. You know, you ask him to help you. Especially when you have been standing a while and something hasn't moved. It's good. You, you probably should have done this earlier, but God, there's something choked up here. There's something not working. Show me where I've missed it because I know the word works I know you're a good God. If there's something I need to adjust, Lord, 
I mean, you know, Hopkins, he couldn't just stand still on the 50-yard line and depend on the ball to get that to him. He has to run a route. And he'd go down the, the, the sideline and he'd, he'd cut at a 45 ang year, uh, angle and go out to midfield and the middle of the field and then he'd, he'd hook and the ball would be waiting on him. So they'd practice that over and over and again. He had to arrive at the place on the field where the quarterback would deliver the, the pass. If he cut the wrong direction or he didn't run deep enough or he ran too shallow, now he's got to reach or he's got to, he's got to make adjustments right at the last in order to snag that thing. And sometimes it doesn't work because you're way off. And see, a lot of times God's trying to get you something and you're out of position. My job is to get you in position. And I mentioned about someone being a baby in their prayer life, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. You know, when I was a child, I spoke as a child and acted as a child, but when I'm grown up, see, I need to grow up in some things. First, Ephesians 4, 15, let's grow up unto him in all things. It's time to grow up. It's time to mature in our prayer life and not just ask for everything under the sun. Let's Let's get laser focused on what do we need right now. We're about to come into a time of great world revival. I mean, this end time harvest is coming. It's coming. God's not through with America. Haven't given up on it. So we all have to grow in maturity. I think about Brother Ed Dufresne. It was about 10 years ago, maybe a little more. He was right here in the church. He's in heaven now. But uh, <clears throat> he got to be a real good friend. I mean, we, we'd spend time and just had a wonderful fellowship when he would come. And uh, privileged to know him. And he, uh, he was here, and he had just been diagnosed with cancer. And he said, so I fasted. He said it from the pulpit. He told the testimony. He said, I, I went to the Lord. I fasted and prayed, searching. Where had I opened the door? Where had I interrupted my receiver? Where had I failed to walk in health? to allow this cancer to come on me because now I've got I've to I've attack it. I've got to kill it. I've got to spend time doing that. And that's not, you know, he, he realized that's not right for me to, you know, you know, a lot of people just say, oh, well, I got cancer. Well, you know, it, sometimes that happens. I know that. But, you know, sometimes, like, I listened to him. He gave the testimony. So he just went, went and he... Fasted and prayed a couple of days, and it wasn't just a couple of days that he knew. God began to deal with him on the fact that he hadn't been resting. Well, rest? What do you, you mean keep the Sabbath day? No, I, the Sabbath day is for Jews, and it starts on, you know, on Friday night, goes to Saturday night, and you're supposed to not do any work. That's the law. We don't have to keep the law for righteousness. We don't keep the Sabbath. But the principle is rest. The principle is not working seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24-7, multitasking all the way through life, taking every double time, every time and a half overtime shift that you can just to support a lifestyle. I know this is hard for maybe some of you to hear, but I'm telling you, God has rest in the Bible because our bodies have to rest. And when you don't rest, then you're not really trusting him. You're working your way into the grave. So, you know, he, he opened the dialogue with, the, with God, and God said, well, you know, you just you work too much. You go everywhere, and then when you get home, you're still working. You're, you've got your real estate business you're working on. You've got your cars. He had a collection of cars. He had hot rod. He had a car nut like I am. So we had a lot of things to talk about. He had a hot rod. He was, you know, working on this, working on that. He was always working. He's just one of those kind of guys. He's a, 
you know, I don't want to call him a workaholic, but that's what he looked like. He, he, he doesn't know what it's like to just lay on the couch and take a nap. I take a nap almost every day. I don't care. I don't, I don't keep office hours. I have a staff that takes care of stuff, and I'm, I'm not down here hovering over them. I come to the staff meeting, you know, and I'll get in knowledge of what's generally happening. I, we had a wonderful night, Friday night. A couple hundred people or something were here. Man, that was a tremendous success of a, of a screening, a, a really necessary. We're doing this for our, for our community now. We're doing this to wake the church up. I wasn't here. Why? Because I rested. I can't do everything. I'm doing something right this morning. It's more important than a lot of the things that I was doing before. I love the songs. I wrote one of them this morning, but I did. I sang along, but I didn't get up here and, and do it because they're doing it. They're doing a great job. I don't have to do that anymore. I've delegated some things. But anyway, he, he, uh, he had to repent. So, okay, God. I'm, and so he had to make, it was hard to do. He had to unschedule some of his churches. He, his, his, his deal was he'd leave and he'd be gone like uh, three days in a church and then fly to another part of the country and do another three days and then fly home and then start it all over again. On the one day he's home, he's not resting. He's either flying, he's preaching, or he's messing with something at home, his real estate or his... So he had to start finding ways to back off of that schedule. And, uh, and he got his healing. He, he made that adjustment to his receiver. And he received his healing. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. So as you learn to adjust your receiver, you will experience more of God's kingdom blessings. Mm -hmm.